Thank you for watching NTD Business Top Stories tonight. The U.S. Virgin Islands is suing J.P. Morgan. It alleges that J.P. Morgan did business with Jeffrey Epstein for over a decade while fully knowing all about his sex trafficking operations. Elon Musk says healthy questioning is part of science, and he announced a new Twitter policy to support that. And Amazon's value shrank by 50% this year. It lost hundreds of billions in market cap. But where are tech stocks going next year? We speak to a portfolio manager. That and much more coming up on NTD Business. Great to have you with us. Don Ma here. The U.S. Virgin Islands is suing J.P. Morgan Chase, America's biggest bank. It's accusing J.P. Morgan of knowingly helping and concealing Jeffrey Epstein's sex trafficking operations for over a decade. The Virgin Islands says that Epstein gave the bank a lot of business. He had a big financial footprint and he brought deals in high-profile clients. The Virgin Islands claims as as Epstein was making J.P. Morgan money, J.P. Morgan didn't mind that he was involved with sex trafficking, sexual assault, forced labor, child abuse, and sexual servitude of young women and even children. The Virgin Islands says that Epstein trafficked underage girls to the Virgin Islands, held them captive, and sexually abused them, causing them grave mental injury. In fact, the islands accuses J.P. Morgan of directly facilitating payments for these young girls, as well as giving Epstein the money for his criminal operations. And not just that, J.P. Morgan allegedly rewarded employees who were involved and gave out bonuses and promotions for those who covered up Epstein's trafficking operation. We spoke to someone who used to work for J.P. Morgan, Mina Tadrus, currently CEO of Tadrus Capital. Tadros explains why it's not at all surprising what his former employer, J.P. Morgan, did. It's routine, right? So you create a set of rules and they just routinely follow these rules. So anything that um, um, comes up outside of these parameters of the rules is sometimes ignored if it's specifically something new or, um, you know, it could, it could possibly um, be ignored uh, because of, you know, the cost-benefit analysis. The risk of getting caught is smaller than... Uh, uh, the cost of business uh, across the bank uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, so, so this is a common practice for banks, and basically I was exposed to that when working for J.P. Morgan. Tadros was a derivatives consultant at J.P. Morgan. He says he was not at all involved with Epstein in any way. He also says it's common for banks to turn a blind eye toward controversial clients when those clients bring a lot of business. One example is is HSBC, Europe's largest bank by assets. It provided money laundering services to Latin American drug cartels. It also allegedly did business with Iran and tried to hide it. Other banks like ING, Credit Suisse, the Royal Bank of Scotland, and Barclays were all caught illegally doing business with countries they shouldn't be. Tadru says these banks do something called cost-benefit analysis. A lot of these banks, they end up paying a small fee uh, but it's, it ends up, unfortunately, being worth it for them uh, because they, they, they got caught this time. But they probably have, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands of, of uh, clients like him uh, where they're essentially turning a blind eye. So um, so I, I would speculate that J.P. Morgan wouldn't have a problem paying the fine. And unfortunately, I, I don't think it's going to change much as far as their business practices. The Virgin Islands did not sue J.P. Morgan for a specified amount. It wants to determine the amount later during trial. We reached out to J.P. Morgan but didn't respond before airtime. Moving on. Missing funds are coming to the surface as court proceedings track down customer money allegedly misused by FTX. NTD's Star Marshall has more. The trails of FTX customers' vanished deposits are starting to come to light. $200 $200 million was used to fund investments in two companies. FTX Ventures, a corporate venture capital firm connected to FTX, invested $100 million in Dave, a financial tech company, and another $100 million in Miston Labs, a Web3 company. The two firms aren't associated with any alleged criminal activity by FTX, but the SEC says the investments were funded with FTX customer money. Federal authorities accuse Bankman Freed of stealing billions of dollars from customers of the FTX crypto exchange and using them for personal investments, among other things. Most of that money was allegedly funneled to the hedge fund tied to FTX, Almeida Research. 
But money that Bankman Freed claims to be his is also coming to the surface. Bankman Freed also bought a nearly 7.6% stake in Robinhood, the popular stock trading app, earlier this year, with more than half a billion dollars borrowed from Alameda. It's not clear whether the amount included funds that were allegedly stolen from FTX customers. Sean Marshall, NTD News. And Google will face a class action lawsuit over children's online privacy after a federal court reversed an earlier decision to dismiss the lawsuit this week. The suit claims Google violated children's privacy by tracking their YouTube activity without their parents' consent in order to send them targeted advertising. Google, though, isn't the only one sued. The lawsuit also says content providers like Hasbro, Mattel, and DreamWorks lured children to their YouTube channels knowing that they would be tracked. A federal court will reconsider the case. Elon Musk has announced a new Twitter policy. The new guidelines are to follow the science. But Musk says that part of that process is the reasoned questioning of the science. NTD's Daniel Monahan has the story. The Greek Euripides said question everything, but the old Twitter policy could better be described as question everything that conflicts with official government positions. That is, at least according to David Zweig's latest COVID-themed Twitter files. Zweig wrote that Twitter did suppress views, many from doctors and scientific experts that conflicted with the official positions of the White House. As a result, legitimate findings and questions that would have expanded the public debate went missing. He says the accounts of doctors and others were suspended or shadow banned for tweeting opinions and demonstrably true information. The following are some examples. Stanford's Dr. Jay Bhattacharya argued that COVID lockdowns would harm children. He said that places that avoided lockdowns had better results. Places that have followed such a strategy, Florida, uh, Sweden, other places around the world, have done much better in terms of overall health outcomes. That got him on a trends blacklist that prevented his tweets from trending. Harvard epidemiologist Martin Koldorf tweeted that, quote, thinking that everyone must be vaccinated is as scientifically flawed as thinking no one should. Those with prior natural infection don't need it, nor children. Koldorf's tweet was hit with a misleading label and all replies and likes were shut off. American cardiologist Dr. Peter McCullough, formerly vice chief of internal medicine at Baylor University Medical Center, saw his account banned for vocally warning people about the dangers of myocarditis in connection with COVID vaccines. And mRNA vaccine researcher Robert Malone's account was apparently suspended for challenging the effectiveness of the vaccines. Meanwhile, Musk tweeted yesterday that anyone who says that questioning them is questioning science itself cannot be regarded as a scientist. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. And on Wall Street, main indexes closed higher in a year-end rally. The Dow rose 345 points, or 1 and 1 tenths of a percent. S&P added 66 points, or 1 and 8 tenths of a percent. NASDAQ gained 265 points, or 2 and 6 tenths of a percent. Amazon stock has tumbled over 50 percent this year. Shares for the online retailer performed at their worst in over 20 years. Amazon lost some $900 billion in market cap. So what contributed to this? Well, during the height of the pandemic, it gave Amazon a boost to its stock as sales soared and people shifted to online shopping from home. But as the pandemic faded and the economy reopened, consumers began to go back to in-store shopping. Still, Amazon performed better than Tesla and Meta. Their shares are down 68 and 66 percent, respectively. And to get a sense of what the tech sector is going to look like next year, I spoke to a portfolio manager at asset management firm Crescat Capital. Thanks for joining me, Tavi. So this year really hasn't been a good year for tech. We're seeing Amazon losing 50 percent of its value. And you recently tweeted about this as well, this topic. So I want to get your thoughts. Where do you think tech stocks are headed next year, 2023? Well, I think there are some companies that still have a lot of downside risk, and Apple is one of the, uh, the I think the main ones, still has a 58% down, downside risk uh, compared to Amazon, for instance, which is already at their March 2020 lows. And if you look at most of the darlings in the markets in general, 
of this past cycle that we've had. Uh, majority of them are already trading at those March 2020 lows. So I think that that's the general roadmap for the overall market. And so that's what I'm expecting. I think Apple is one of the companies that have been sort of holding up this market in the last uh, month or so, despite this weakness that we've had. And so I think that that's the next shoe to drop is on companies like Apple or Microsoft uh, that still have a, a pretty pretty large downside relative to others. So as far as positioning for our funds, uh, Apple is our largest uh, short position as of today. And, uh, and we think that there's uh, certainly a lot of opportunities ahead in terms of shorting the name uh, for now. And I, if I can think of a company that will be even more uh, impacted by, especially the deglobalized trends that we've had and a company that's really benefited from cheap labor is certainly Apple. And it still is a consumer discretion at why a lot of people think it's a stable company because everybody needs an iPhone, it still is a consumer discretionary business overall. So I'm expecting that to be catching up with other parts of the market. And so overall, I think technology companies still have a lot of downside uh, to, uh, to go. And, and what signs are, what evidence is, is pointing to that? Well, the evidence is, is really what's going on with this repositioning in markets that we've had over the last uh, couple, uh, maybe year or so from the growth to value transition, which I think it's a long-term trend, uh, it also has to do with uh, this issue of uh, a lot of those companies in the technology realm are have been uh, you know with very large multiples with growth multiples because they are growth companies. But when we get into a space where cost of capital is a little larger or higher, which is certainly the case now, uh, you start focusing more on profitability and profitability of companies uh, is is quite different. So let's just say you use Apple again as an example. It still trades at about 22 or so times earnings of next year. Uh, and, and that is that is just a very hefty multiple, given the fact that we don't think the company is going to grow whatsoever uh, in the next 12 months. And, you know, if not, it's likely to contract. So all those factors are playing into this transition from value or from growth to value stocks, which I think that there's more to go and, and technology will be uh, suffering from that uh, transition as well. So Wedbush Securities uh, recently said that there's going to be a surge of possibly 20 percent in the tech sector. Uh, as companies, uh, you know, work to protect profit profitability, and and as the Federal Reserve winds down, what what are your thoughts on that? I, that's not my view as of now. I think that there are some technology companies that already came down too much, um, which I'm not willing to really short. Amazon's a great example. We're not short Amazon at this point, um, or Netflix or Meta. Um, so I think you want to be selective on the names. So while I'm very bearish in the overall market for the next, uh, call it two quarters or so, uh, I do think that there's a, a risk for a repositioning in the very first week of 2023, um, especially towards treasuries. Uh, but that's just going to be short-lived, in my opinion. Um, technology is uh, a very large part of the market uh, that will continue to deteriorate, in my opinion. Um, and so most of the sort of short-lived rallies that we may see, uh, I think will create opportunities to uh, fund like ours to take advantage and short uh, more of those names over over the next uh, you know 12 to 24 months so that's kind of the goal I mean I, I think uh, you know you got to be very selective in general all right great thanks for your insight Tavi Costa Crestcat Capital pleasure speaking to you first time weekly unemployment claims are up again 225,000 new claims were filed last week 9,000 more than the previous week's tally of 216,000. Besides the new claims, continuing claims also ticked up to their highest level since February. 1.7 million for the week ending December 17th. Those claims are filed by people who've received unemployment benefits for more than a week. Weekly jobless claims are volatile, especially around the holidays, and frequently subject to revision. Southwest Airlines continues to slash about two-thirds of its daily schedule, canceling nearly 2,400 flights today. An outdated scheduling system seems to be one of the main reasons for the meltdown. The airline's flight attendance union says they've raised the issue before. Oh, we've had conversations with uh, the executive leadership, with uh, the previous CEO, Gary Kelly, uh, Mike Vandeven. We explained uh, that as hot as we were running the operation, that the systems were continuing to be an issue. We have brought forth uh, solutions and um, technology provisions in, at the table, and it's pretty much been ignored. Southwest is struggling to recover after being overwhelmed by a winter storm. Hundreds of pilots and flight attendants were stranded and unable to crew flights. 
Other airlines are back to full strength. According to FlightAware, Delta, American and United together had canceled only around 30 flights by late morning. Southwest accounted for more than 95 percent of all canceled flights in the U.S. today. Southwest has acknowledged that it has inadequate and outdated technology to handle severe weather when it strikes. The federal government is investigating what happened at Southwest. The Dallas-based carrier has canceled more than 13,000 flights since December 22nd. Officials in Buffalo have arrested 10 people for alleged looting during the blizzard. Police say more arrests are coming and they are urging people to turn themselves in. As I've said multiple times, we will be making more arrests. I strongly urge a lot of these uh, incidents that had video, you're out there, you've been on social media, you've been on TV, do yourself a favor, make things very easy for yourself, just come in and turn yourself in, accept the consequences and the responsibility of what you did so we can get these businesses back on track to serve the community that they are there for. Looters targeted stores during the winter storm over the weekend. Videos given to local news outlets show a number of storefronts with smashed out windows. The mayor of Buffalo said these are not people in distress. Instead, they're taking advantage of the disaster. The blizzard is the worst to strike western New York in 45 years and has claimed 38 lives in the Buffalo area. Now turning to China, one of the country's global ambitions seems to be having a setback. China's digital currency is little used, a former official of the country's central bank said on Wednesday. This according to financial news outlet Caixin. Xie Ping was Financial Stability Bureau Director of the People's Bank of China. He expressed disappointment with the result of a recent trial of the digital yuan. China started pushing the trial in some provinces and cities some two years ago. Experts believe this was the first step in China's ambition to have the yuan surpass the dollar as the world's dominant currency. But Xie pointed out that in the two years of the trial, only 100 billion digital yuan were circulated. That's about $14 billion. He added that the usage was low and highly inactive. In comparison, before the pandemic, the daily circulation of Chinese yuan was equivalent of about $285 billion. Moving on to Europe, ExxonMobil is suing the European Union. It's over a windfall tax on energy companies making record profits. Exxon says the tax will undermine investor confidence, discourage investment, and increase the EU's reliance on imported energy. Exxon's German and Dutch subsidiaries filed a lawsuit yesterday. In September, the EU announced emergency measures that would charge companies that make record profits this year. The Financial Times reports that Exxon is challenging whether the EU has the legal authority to impose the new tax. Exxon has said that the tax could cost the company at least $2 billion through the end of next year. 2022 marked the return of in-person car shows following the pandemic. But numerous major brands decided not to show up. Instead, some have decided to stage their own unveils. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more on the latest rides. Traditional car shows were back and in person. One was the Paris Motor Show in October. French brands were present, but big international names chose to skip the event. Renault had a very good presence. They had all of the Renault Group brands there, but even Stellantis with um, French brands in Peugeot, Citroën and DS. It's almost un- unimaginable that there'd be a, a Paris Motor Show without Citroën, but Citroën wasn't there, leaving stands to Peugeot and DS, and it was all, all quite condensed into quite a small space. The Detroit Auto Show made a similar disappointing comeback a month earlier. One of the highlights of the show was the presentation of the new Ford Mustang. The car will go on sale next summer and may be the last gas-powered version of the muscle car. The electric transition also made its way to the luxury car industry. Rolls-Royce introduced its first battery-powered model on October 17th. Spectre has an expected range of 320 miles and an acceleration of 0 to 60 in 4.4 seconds. What you see here side of me is uh, the Rolls-Royce Spectre, the very first full electric Rolls-Royce in history. Uh, A project we were working on for quite a while, as you can imagine. And we are now at a state that uh, we have the technology at our hands. The electrification of mobility solutions also reached flying cars in 2022. The Detroit Auto Show featured an air mobility experience this year. 
The Icon A5 is a two-seat amphibious light sport aircraft with retractable wings. Owners can also haul the aerial vehicle behind a truck or SUV. Honestly, I think this is the future of shows. It's no longer, you know, uh, just an auto show. It's a mobility show, um, which gives you a glimpse of all of those vehicle types, including the ones that fly. We'll know more about the future of the traditional car show in 2023. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. The tourism industry began to make a recovery in 2022 after being hit during pandemic lockdowns. This year, countries across the world were excited to welcome back tourists. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more on some of the globe's popular destinations. Barcelona's beaches and streets were packed in July and August. Local officials said arrivals this summer were still around 15% to 20% down from 2019. But the city's tourism industry has started to recover. It's evident that the tourism sector has been reactivated. It has normalized to some extent, but with some differentiated elements. There's more proximity tourism. People want to go and travel. Another popular destination, Vienna. The European city is known for its imperial Habsburg architecture. The Austrian capital's notoriously good infrastructure and affordable public transport make it stand out. The criteria used for international rankings are, of course, topics such as infrastructure, public transport, education, and healthcare. And Vienna is in a very fortunate position in this respect. Tourists also went on camel safaris to see wildlife in Kenya's national parks. Riding the animals is considered better for the environment than taking vehicles. They don't create any emissions or tear up the ground beneath them. Ecotourism is not a hoax. It's real. This brings nature closer to us and us closer to nature. And the more close to your nature, the more you understand it, the more you like it, and the more the less that you will not destroy it. Greenland reported a return to 2019 tourist levels this summer. The small town of Kangerlussik is 30 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Here, tourists can take a 15-mile bus trip to Russell Glacier. Belgian tourist Camilla Bruckner wanted to visit before it's too late. This was as much a trip we did because there is very much a sense of urgency that we have to see this now before it disappears. From 2015 to 2016, Greenland saw visitor numbers increase from around 77,000 per year to almost 105,000. That's a large number, given the island's 56,000 residents. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And that's the latest stories from the NTD business team and myself, Don Ma. You can follow me on Twitter, too, if you're there. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, you can email us at business at ntd.com. That's all for today. Thank you for watching. I'll see you tomorrow.